Hello and welcome to the special video podcast that we are doing as part of National Startup Day. This is part of a network 18 in IDFC First Bank initiative called Leap to Unicorn, where we bring together leading entrepreneurs, investors, and mentors to help startups gain access to mentoring, boot camping sessions, and even funding in really making that leap from seed to scale. This is an initiative that we're very proud of and we're very excited to welcome, uh, shall I say, two icons, two doyans of the Indian startup ecosystem, Sanjeev Bikchandani and Deep Kalra, the founders of InfoEdge and Make My Trip, which are the OGs when it comes to Indian internet companies. And they've really seen the whole journey uh, from idea to IPO. And, you know, this will really help startups learn about how to play the long game because you all have played it for what over 20 years now 23 and counting sanjeev even longer yeah 26 or 27 i forget right but take us through the journey because today there's a lot of excitement around startups the government you know has put so much of trust on startups but back when you were starting <coughs> up what was it like uh, sanjeev deep sanjeev. okay i uh, quit my job in 1990 and became an entrepreneur Except in those days, we didn't call it startup entrepreneurship. We simply said, I'm starting a business. The terminology has changed. Uh, but, you know, the work hasn't. Uh, you roll up your sleeves and do it. And yes, uh, in those days, there was a lot less capital. Uh, there was um, less of an ecosystem. Uh, but you just did what had to be done. You went out and got customers. You had a product and you sold it. Deep? Yeah, I guess not very different. A few years after Sanjeev. And uh, I think it's pretty well known that uh, Sanjeev has been a guiding light for me. So he's truly the master of Indian startups, which weren't called startups then, but internet startups for sure, I think. And so I quit after eight years of working after my MBA as well. I did three different jobs and then I quit GE Capital to, jo to start Make My Trip. You know, to be honest, uh, didn't think that long and hard. When you're in your late 20s, just about 30, uh, you can take much more risk. But... I think what drove me was, um, frankly, the internet. If the internet mm. didn't happen, I wouldn't have turned an entrepreneur. So I had no entrepreneurial dreams right through, you know, my MBA or through my jobs. I was very clear that uh, I want a corporate job. But the internet, I think, really convinced me that this is going to change everything we do. Uh, we were trying to make a difference at G Capital itself. Uh, I must give Pramod credit for uh, wanting to start G india.com uh, but it dawned on me pretty soon that uh, this is going to be something which you have to do a hundred percent it can't be a side project and i think that is what is special about a startup you are all in you can't be just doing it on the side so every now and then you know i meet uh, some young founders who are saying one of us is full-time the other one will quit when something happens i always tell them it won't happen you have to do a hundred percent you're in or out and i think that is what is special about the word startup you want to add to that? No, he's absolutely right. I mean, uh, you know, I, I remember a question that I asked on a panel discussion I was on. And he says, what about work-life balance? <laughs> and the answer a co-panelist gave was there's no such thing as work-life balance if you're doing a startup. There's only work-life integration. That's so, so this true. 70 hours week, uh, would you like to weigh in on how many hours both of you have worked in the last <laughs> 23 years? Well, so when I first read that comment, I didn't do the maths fully. I said, Satya to come here. It was my first reaction. <laughs> then I saw, uh, you know, people are reacting negatively uh, to this. And I said, yeah, but I couldn't figure out why. If you're doing a startup, I mean, uh, 90 hours, I know whatever it takes. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Especially the early years. I think when you um, scale up and you have people and you reach a certain level where Exis existentialism isn't uh, a crisis because when that is a crisis, you live in office. I mean, we worked for the first five years, uh, six and a half days. There was no concept of any. And six and a half days mean you were in in the morning. Everyone was in by 9, 30, 10 and no one left before midnight. And very often people slept in office. We also had a business serving NRIs. So mm -hmm. very often people slept in office. Everyone kept a toothbrush in office, slept under a table, over a table. Now you're back again because there was survival and you had to do everything that you wanted to make sure that you could do to make sure that your you know, company survives and you thrive. So I think that's crisis mode. It can't last forever. 
then things ease off i think two things happen one you get people to do certain things hmm. be you grow up uh, you reach a different stage in life in terms of just maybe kids growing up and realizing that you have to the integration has to work towards balance so definitely balance comes but only when the company is stable and you know that the company is not going anywhere people are uh, going to get paid regularly then you can think about saying okay listen uh, i should go home it's 9 o'clock at night i should go home now because i have a family at home but the beauty for me the asset test is that when family is traveling do you go home at all and then you realize if you don't go home clearly because a you love your work which is very typical of a startup b there's never something you can say okay work's done for today that doesn't exist in our world impossible no but look i mean uh, you like i said you got to do what it takes and very often especially in india uh, you know doing what it takes means uh, doing it 24/7 hmm and you know it's interesting how both of you went to the same school uh, the same college and the same institute of management right the trajectory has almost been similar but it's also been a little uncanny but he's what 7 years your junior 6 years junior When same did... college and same course both did e-commerce i'm telling you i just followed what he does <laughs> <laughs> that's the best thing to do yeah there's i don't i don't he went no, to no, the internet a, i went to the internet it's, it's, a, it's a coincidence but yeah it's a it's a it's quite a coincidence yeah and when you decided to start up in your respective areas right um you went into classifieds and jobs and you went into uh, travel yeah. um again who did you look to for mentorship because the entrepreneurs of today they can i mean there are you know at least two generations of entrepreneurs before them vcs who've seen multiple cycles how did you deal with those initial days the doubts that creep in whether you're doing the right thing this whole thing about product market fit and everything yeah this is all jargon <laughs> even mentoring the word mentoring is jargon right you so i had nobody to go to because when i started in 1990 uh, you know you were doing your own thing and you were figuring it out as you went along and you learned by doing okay uh, now the term mentoring was invented i think by the mentors not by the by the, by the founders <laughs> but uh, and uh, you know it's, it's just about having conversations you meet somebody you have a conversation it's if something comes out of it fine and nothing about it it's okay but look there wasn't much of an ecosystem in 1990 when i quit my job um and uh, and so the first 10 years you drifted did a whole bunch of small things and figured things out as you went along well i was a little bit more fortunate so a few years behind helped so of course i had sanjeev and sanjeev i had known actually through a very interesting interaction so i obviously didn't know him in school or college because the gap was pretty pretty large but there were these ims classes uh, to get into mba to crack the interview particularly especially if you're taking the cat and sanjeev and a bunch of his friends used to run them i think it was lady of in college So first year I took those classes to get in and next year I put my hand up they wanted volunteers to help on a little bit of money so I was actually helping out there too and one thing led to another uh, and so I did lean on him I continue to lean on him shamelessly he's been on our board for many years now he's been an advisor for many years so one but I agree with Sanjeev that you know you reach out to people at least my style is there's no one mentor for everything and I tell youngsters the same I think you need to reach out to different people for different things and sometimes it's a 10 minute conversation which can give you the answer and that's important to take like someone will help you with one particular thing so when we were listing hmm. I had a big decision to make the board very rare time where our board was split right down the middle since he was on our board list in India was a list overseas this was way back in 2010 and I was truly confused and I uh, reached out to five or six different people spoke to them picked up the phone literally called them and they were very helpful right from mondas pai I, i reached out to nandan who i knew through some connection nandan put me on to mondas he gave me advice a classmate of mine from imm ahmedabad polak gave me some advice because he had been on boards of different companies and jeev had his point of view so i think it was great to talk to four five different people and then really understand okay these are the pros and cons so i i encourage entrepreneurs to do that but don't say listen i want one hour of your time people don't have one hour to give sometimes they have one question and you should go with one question maximum two and say i w- who will say no to answering one question and it's a genuine question and not something which is you know all pedantic that's, and that's made up great just go listen yeah. i'm having this problem i'm not able to get a good you know cfo what should i do so you know they one can apply oneself and say maybe today to, you're too young to get a cfo your company is too young to get a cfo maybe you can rely on companies outside today and there are companies which give cso cfo as a service 
I'm giving an example. So people have genuine issues where I think they should just come with one issue at a time. And we are both part of TIE also, and we've been part of TIE for the longest time. And there we believe the cornerstone is mentoring, even though Sanjeev has rubbished the word, but we, we, <laughs> it's, it's conversations. Yeah, it's conversations. <laughs> but we encourage don't, people. I, to I, I, say, I say what he says, don't overcomplicate it. It's just a conversation. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. And ask who will say no. Like, you know, if you meet someone, a young person in your line saying, hey, Chandra, I really want to talk to you about this one little thing. It's bothering me. I'm not able to get over this. Where should I go and study? What should I do? You'll give them time. Mm -hmm. Everyone can make five, ten minutes to answer one question. But sit down for an hour then becomes a commitment and everyone's busy. So. Right. I um, remember in 2005, hmm. I flew down to Bombay just for one meeting. I wanted to meet Ajit Balakrishnan to ask him what's it like having listed in the US because we had a choice. Read if. Uh, uh, read yeah. If, yeah. So we, have a, we had a choice in 2005. We could list in India or overseas because this rule of not being able to list overseas came in only in mid-2005. So when we began our IPO conversations, we had a choice. Uh, uh, yaha pe, yaha pe. And uh, instinctively, I felt happy. But I went to Bombay to talk to Ajit and I spent half an hour with him. And he gave me a very clear answer. The Mahim office. Was, Ajit was one of my influences too in the early days. So actually, both of you had the same dilemma, right? And ultimately, you ended up listing here and you ended up... Oh, that's listing. because the government banned overseas listings uh, un until you're listed in India first. Uh, around that time, just a little after my conversation. So, so different reasons, different time. But I think you recently said that you will be open to an India listing. Is that something that you I love the way at? press likes to complete the <laughs> sentences. <laughs> no, I think we're evaluating. And firstly, the decision now is entirely Rajesh. So my co-founder right. Rajesh is the CEO. He runs so Rajesh and our CFO Mohit, who've been around now for right through our listing. It's not something we don't evaluate. But mm -hmm. managing two listings is very hard. Managing one is hard enough. Yeah. One, it takes a lot of time. Uh, B, it takes a lot of money. So you have to be careful and, you know, our stock has, uh, you know, thankfully done really well over the last few quarters. It's, so I think if, if you're able to unlock value, you're able to do well, then you say, okay, fair enough. But if you feel that, listen, that market is not right for you, you are get, you'll do much better. Your stock will perform much better. The returns to investors will be much better in a different market. You have to evaluate it. And of course, uh, I mean, it's something so we're constantly keeping an eye on. Is, right. No, in his case, of course, uh, you know, there'll be, there are many, many investors who are shut out of the U.S., Indian investors, mm -hmm. and the businesses from India. So there's a logic also that in the market where your consumers are, perhaps uh, you need to provide access to uh, your stock to investors from that market. Maybe. Yeah, true. No, no, absolutely. Which also explains why SaaS firms would prefer uh, listing abroad. I think uh, there the challenge, I think the, the, the landscape has changed over the last three or four years where you need to be much larger. Issues need, to be, issues need to be larger, your, your revenue base needs to be larger for you to be relevant and of interest in the US and which is why I think um, perhaps uh, one has done it. I do not know how many more will do it in how much time. Hmm. Um, so, you know, when you all started up, did you uh, think that you would be building for 23 years? I mean, we meet and interact with so many startups as part of our Leap to Unicorn boot camps, but what would your advice be to entrepreneurs who, you know, to play the long game? A, is it worth playing the long game? Because these days people get exits through secondaries and so on. Um, what would your advice be to the founder of, I don't know, 2023, 2024? You want to go first? Right. No, so see, when I started out, I wanted to be an entrepreneur. That is a long game. What business I'll pursue for what length of time, you know, I kept drifting. But the moment you raise external capital, and we did from ICSA Venture, you make commitments, you sign uh, an agreement, and you, they look you in the eye and they say, yeah, I'm here. And I'm playing the long game, and you commit. So when you, when the moment you take somebody else's money, I think uh, you up your levels of commitment simply because now you're responsible for other people's money. And that's what happened to me. Right? Because uh, then you had to scale, you had to create value, and you have to do it in a certain time period in order to generate return for your shareholders. And frankly, I'll just add to that because I totally <coughs> agree. I, I think uh, there's nothing more satisfying than building a durable company and a durable brand. And that is by far, like I think should be the biggest driver for any entrepreneur, which is to build something special, build something durable, build a brand people love. What could be more rewarding? Everything else is a byproduct. So I always tell youngsters that, listen, don't chase money. 
because of two big reasons. One is when you will achieve that number you're chasing, it's a big anticlimax because nothing will change in your life. <laughs> and, and secondly, more likely than not, that will keep going further away. So chase the right things, build something special, build something which is better than anyone is doing that in the country or in the world today, especially on the internet, and everything else will follow. Secondly, the advice is really that uh, when you start a business, minimum four to five years is what you have to give it. Too many guys give up too early. When I say guys, I mean guys and girls just give up too early because they get anxious, they get impatient, their opportunity cost is very high, I gave up a great job, I could be doing this. No, if you don't have it in you, you don't have the stamina to last four to five years, don't start a business. If something great happens earlier, wow. But for, it takes that long to even know if what you're starting is actually got the potential of becoming something big. Then take it as it comes. I mean, you know, then of course, some people are driven by doing multiple businesses, want to check out, it's a personal call. I think clearly in our case, both of us were nowhere. I, I don't even think, and maybe I've never asked Sanjeev this, but yes, there were some very tough times where you were being forced to do something, at least in our case, we were being forced like almost to sell and thankfully those things didn't happen. And IPO was the big dream. And it's a huge dream because then you can open up, it's the beginning of a new chapter and you can continue to build. That's the beauty of an IPO. Sanjeev? No, I think um, if you look at globally, truly great companies, they, they last a long, long time, mm. right? Uh, and truly great companies are usually the product of a lifetime's effort for a core group of people. So you look at Google, started in 98, uh, the founders are still there. You look at Facebook, started in 2005, uh, founders are still there, right? So if you want to build a truly great company, you've got to have a belief that I want to create something that will outlive me and I'm committing my life to it, okay? And if you want to build a truly great institution, then that's the level of commitment required in terms of years of working there and being willing to commit. Right, and what would your advice I mean, be to entrepreneurs when it comes to governance, because, you know, there are two two arguments to this. I mean, a startup is too young. How are they even supposed to have these processes in place, board in place? You know, they have to focus on the idea first. But we've also seen instances of governance lapses, particularly in the last few years. What do you make of it? Why is it happening? Are investors not doing their job or, you know, are more entrepreneurs keen on instant gratification? Where does the fault line lie? Look, investors invest behind founders who they believe are committed, capable, and honest, right? Uh, sometimes that judgment is wrong. It's sad, but it sometimes it's wrong. Uh, according to me, corporate governance begins and ends in the founders' heads. A crooked founder will find his or her way around all sorts of boards, processes, auditors, everything, right? Uh, but eventually there's a, there's a decent chance you'll be found out, right? And when that happens, you know, it won't be good. Okay? So the fundamental thing is be honest, be good to your minority shareholders, honor all commitments and agreements, follow the law of the land, tell the truth, do your MIS and accounts accurately and faithfully, right? These are not big things. Mm. Now, you don't want to put complicated processes in upfront, that's fine. But if you yourself are committed to this, right, you won't do anything wrong. So surround yourself with good people and listen to them. Okay, so I'll tell you two or three pieces of advice I got early on. Uh, so the so one was from our investors, ICICI Venture. The other was from an uh, auditor, right? So ICICI Venture invested in April 2000. Within uh, one week, they came to Delhi and they said, okay, some ground rules. Number one, you will not get rich till we get rich. <laughs> Number two, you will not get rich on our money. Which basically means we decide your salary and you can't sell a single share until we have sold. Because if you sell shares and you become rich, you probably won't try hard enough. No skin in the game. I mean, you, you took some money out and you're happy now. Right? They also said, we want a big five auditor. In those days, there were five. And uh, so I went shopping. And I met uh, Kaushik Datta, who was then a partner at Pricewaterhouse. And uh, we hit it off. And he said, look, I like you. What do you want? I said, look, we're a small company. 
36 lakhs turned over. I can't afford you guys actually. So what do you want? I said, I want an audit in one lakh rupees. <laughs> so he said, okay, fine. I like you. I'll do an audit in one lakh rupees, but commit to me two or three things. Right? I said, what? He said, commit to me that you won't hide anything. You won't lie. So I won't have to work too hard to audit you. Because in one lakh rupees, I can't work too hard. So I said, that is, you have a commitment that we are honest and we'll be transparent and we, that's how we are. That's not a problem. He said, second thing, commit to me, uh, that you will internalize and recognize the fact that your board members and your auditors are there to save you from yourself. Right? We are not outsiders to to police you. We are here to save you from yourself because founders do all kinds of crazy things. Uh, so you're going to keep talking to us and we'll guide you. I said, yeah, that you have a commitment. Okay? And both these things stayed with me. Uh, there was another piece of advice I got from a uh, venture capitalist who gave us a term sheet, which we did not take. This is Satish Mandana of CDC, which is now called Actis. And he said, look for situations of creating convergence of interest and not conflict of interest. Hmm. Because if you do that with your investors, other shareholders, uh, your senior managers, your customers, everybody, uh, then uh, everybody's on the same side of the table and the company will succeed. Those are amazing words of wisdom. <laughs> Hard to add to that, but I have to tell you one thing and then I mean, I cannot imagine a scenario where, you know, you don't have secondaries. It's kind of become so commonplace these days where yeah, founders, uh, we are you know, sell that. a part of their shares in uh, every round of funding. We are uncomfortable with it. So I like Sanjeev's way of putting it. It's binary, really. The values, it comes from the values of the founder. The values of a company are the values of the founders. Founders slash founders. That's mm -hmm. very that's very clear. It just percolates right through. And it's binary. You will either give in to temptation or you will not. Uh, but I do believe, Sanjeev, at times what happens is too much pressure and too much money comes in too early. Mm -hmm. And too much pressure. And young founders, I don't think all of them mean to cut corners but some of them under the pressure then give way to something which they probably don't even understand that they're doing something that wrong so therefore some coaching some level and that's where the board plays a role that's where the investor plays a role but fundamentally you can't be a founder who says i know people who keep three sets of accounts the big that's a recipe for disaster which is one for the tax man one for the investors and one for themselves that's crazy a you're making life complicated you're starting off all wrong Keep it very simple. One book of accounts. I've always believed when there's bad news, as a founder, you are the first one to give it to the board. The board should not hear about it from someone else. And Sanjeev was on our board and we had many bad news. We would we would be like straight away because and it lifts a big weight off your chest. So I don't know why people get worried doing that. But, you know, I, I, I can't put it the way Sanjeev, Sanjeev put it. I can't put it any better. But I have to give you one great uh, story which has always stayed with me. And of course, it's about Sanjeev. So uh, when he joined our board, we had to either pay him board fees or we had a provision that we could give it in stock. When we were unlisted, he joined our board in 2005 and till we listed in 2010, he was on the board. So he said, listen, I don't want anything. I said, no, you have to take something. We'll give you what we're giving the other independent directors. So uh, he said, okay, shares or whatever is fine. So he issued shares in his name, told the CFO. Letter came back the very next day. He says, no, this is not going to be in my name. This has to be in InfoEdge's name because I'm taking company time away and putting it in your company. And that is the highest level of governance. People don't do that, but that's the thinking. So he's helped us a lot directly, indirectly. And there's a lot to learn from people who have been there and done that and how they very clearly keep things separate, you know, related party transactions. Early stage of company, very often people end up giving business to people they know, even when they're related or close friends. Mm. That's a strict no-no. You have yeah. to understand that. That doesn't fly the moment you've taken external capital or even otherwise it's a bad idea. It's always going to create trouble. So keep these things very clear. This is work. This is professional. Don't mix uh, business with pleasure. Right. Um, since we're talking about, you know, National uh, Startup Day, one thing that we encountered during this whole Leap to Unicorn initiative is the regulatory aspect of it. Because again, you know, the government throws in a googly once in a while, though ease of business has gone up significantly, there is still, um, you know, a lot of com uh, complexity around angel tax, how it's how it works, cross border, um, how, you know, should you be domiciled abroad? Should you be domiciled here? Um, what would your advice be to startups to navigate these regulatory hurdles? 
So keep life simple. <laughs> okay, the moment you domicile overseas, but you're operating out of India and your market is India, uh, you're getting into complexity which will come and bite you maybe three years, five years later. Okay, it might seem very good right now, but there will, there will be a problem. Right? Uh, I mean, it's happened in many cases. Right? So try and keep life simple is what I say. Hmm. Right. As far as angel tax is concerned, I mean, uh, so I haven't ever personally encountered a situation where any of our companies got an angel tax notice. But uh, people have told me that, yeah, this is a problem. I, I do think the government needs to address it. In terms of policy yeah. support or removing policy hurdles, what do you think needs Firstly, to be Firstly, I think things are much, much, much easier today. Today, I mean, just talent and everything else, even from policy point of view, things are much better and they're moving in the right direction. Yes, some things come up because I think there are different constituents. So the government, you have to understand, wants something. They want unicorns to grow. They want startups to flourish. They want they understand all of this will work, but they want it to happen in Indian interests. So you have to understand where they are coming from. And then there's another interest in mind. So I think we have to be very clear. I believe that always invest in very good advice. So even if you have to go to the big four, it's expensive. And if the answer is gray, don't go there. Mm. Don't go there. If it's black or white, be very clear. Just be in the black and white and say, we are kosher, we are fine. Because that grey, like Sanjeev said, will come and bite you in the back at some point of time. And go with the best advice. Don't go. There are when big stakes and you've raised money, you have the money. Definitely invest and go for the best advice you can get, whether it's legal or whether it's accounting. Don't go for small time, you know, people who will give you just the advice you want to hear. No, you have to go for the advice which you say, what is the worst case scenario? That's what I typically ask people. What's the worst case scenario? Why are we doing this? Hmm. And only if they say, no, this is completely kosher, then you go for it. See, the moment somebody says, you know, we can do a workaround. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a red flag. So, workaround is... Uh, red flag. Red flag. Red flag. Red flag. Yeah. Red flag. Right. Um, 2024 is also going to be exciting because after 2022, we are going to see a lot of these IPOs um, hit the Lal Street again. We've had a flurry of DRHPs in the last few weeks. First Cry, Ola Electric, Office, um, Unicommerce and so on. Um, do you think there's a certain maturity in both the public markets and the private markets in the way IPOs should be priced, how much money you're leaving on the table for investors, how transparent you are? Because, you know, in the previous phase, certain IPOs didn't fly. Do you think entrepreneurs and public markets also have sort of matured in the last two, three years when it comes to startup IPOs? I think undoubtedly moving in the right direction. There's no question. There's a learning. See, the Indian market never had uh, internet companies, at times loss-making companies, at times companies going where the model itself was not clear, suddenly go out. So it's very hard to price. And again, there are different people and different constituents, right? So there is clearly a motivation on one side to price it higher. You price it too high and you don't grow into your price because you don't have the, uh, the certainty or the model itself is still very choppy, the market and the ecosystem is still not that developed. So the learning from the last couple of years is definitely going to help. You've seen some companies took a little longer to grow into their price, but they did finally. Now you have to figure out a way that, listen, let's not be in that scenario again. Let's price it in a way that it's not this crazy, crazy pop that you're going to get, or worst case, that you're going to be under the water. The under the water is terrible for investors, particularly retail investors, yeah. others who come in. So I think market has definitely learned and you'll find much better uh, uh, you know, pricing now, I think. I think uh, 2024 is different from 2021. Hmm. Right? Uh, the IPOs that went in 2021, many of them were priced right for that market because they did see a pop. But when the market corrected massively, as it did starting from the US, uh, many of them went below the IPO price, some of them are back. Right? Uh, I think in, in 2021, people were willing to, investors were willing to accept uh, companies that would, were currently making a loss, but would be profitable in two, three years. I think that has changed. I'm not sure what the appetite will be now in India for companies currently making a loss, but are promising or indicating a profit in two, three years. I think uh, one big thing is investors will demand profitability now. Hmm. The earnings part of the that you said, yeah. right? Um, I, final couple of questions. Um, as you know, 
to pi pioneers, internet pioneers, what would your prescription or policy advice be to the government to sort of strengthen the startup ecosystem and you know make it even stronger than what is it what it is today? If you have to remove say one hurdle, what would it be? Okay, tough one, but uh, I think uh, s startups don't really need incentives. Okay? They don't really need tax breaks. What they want is to have the freedom to do their business without being harassed by petty bureaucracy, the junior level bureaucracy. Now, now, unfortunately, junior level bureaucracy is not in the control of senior level people at the center. It's at the state. Even though the state is not at the senior level people in the state, it's at the lowest level. Uh, so that is one thing which startups need, uh, but that's a very a tough act to implement. Yeah, I don't know if it's utopian, but it would be wonderful to have a single window clearance, single window ministry, you can call it, or a department, which is for startups. So that, you know, these very often you end up getting letters, love letters, all <laughs> kinds of things from different departments. For a founder, it's very hard. You just don't have the bandwidth. So you end up spending time on stuff like that, whereas you should be spending time on building your product and your company and your team, etc. So I think that would be great who can see it from the startup lens. And it could be for first five years or whatever, you know, some other or maybe there could be other metrics of when they get to certain size. That would be amazing. So really what one is saying is simplification. You know, uh, simplification and then I think Sanjeev's point is, yes, there is sometimes petty bureaucracy which can be very hassling at any point of time, by the way. But later you have at least other people who can deal with it. Mm -hmm. In the initial days, it's the founders going to deal with everything. When we used an IPLC to do our call center calls, when the line went down in the middle of the night, it was my KRA because I would move the fastest and get the linesman in the middle of the night to come and repair the, the fault, which was due to actually rat seating it up in a small, I, I mean it, I, I wow. kid you not. Uh, it was the Tekhan substation in Okla, which every few months the line would be uh, chewed off. So then founders have to do these things. You don't have admin and you don't have other people doing it. So I think if we can see it from the founder's lens, that would be fantastic. Right. Um, what's the next chapter going to be for you? What, where do you see yourself spending a lot of time in the next I, uh, Will I, it still I, be I have, at this have, office? I haven't planned. Huh. I don't think about it. I take it a day at a time. Deep? I'm going to follow Sanjay. You're going to follow him <laughs> on everything. No, no. So clearly yeah. I've, I've uh, you know, I think want to spend more time on uh, uh, what I consider things that matter, non-commercial things. Uh, so I am spending a lot more time on not-for-profits and uh, many passion projects. Uh, but I'm uh, available. I'm, I'm still chairman of Make My Trip. I'm available for anything. And there are some things I'm very involved with, like our foundation work. Or uh, Rajesh and I will discuss a lot of strategy stuff. So I, I, I still fairly involved there, but have freed up a lot of time uh, to help uh, young, young startups. I, if I'm in town, I meet at least one founder. Uh, every day, if not two, and I enjoy that. Right, I'm, I'm sure startups will benefit. But final, final question: What's the one thing as an entrepreneur that you learned from Deep? I think uh, clarity of thought and communication. Uh, Deep is much better at, at, than than I am, so he's a much much better uh, speaker than I am. Deep, what's wow. the one thing that <laughs> you learned? <laughs> there are too many, like I said. <laughs> but but really, I think when it comes to uh, I would say conviction, and I look for conviction even when I hire, but Sanjeev's conviction is amazing. When he believes in an idea, then that's it, which is great, and I've seen that. Um, I think telling tough things the way they are. He really helped me, showed me a mirror where there were some very tough decisions to take at work, people related, etc. He got across to me because he told me this is not about the person, and it's not about you, it's about the company and what the company can do first. And finally, governance, like I said, the highest level, gold standard. So lots to learn. Cool standard, lots to learn. And I'm sure this is going to help a lot of young entrepreneurs. Thank you so much for joining us on this video podcast special as part of National Startup State. Thank you, Sanjeev. Thank you, Deep. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.